1995 onwards, uh, there was a lot of unrest in the Dutch fleet as well. Mm. And, and there were a lot of Dutch sailors who were not that happy to cooperate with the French. And there was a lot of desertions by the, the Dutch fleet uh, towards the English fleet. And uh, so we had uh, our problems as well. And uh, that, that's why uh, at one point that uh, it was in winter, so uh, the ships uh, lay bottles up near to the Nelder and it was freezing and uh, the Dutch fleet was taken there uh, as well. That it's, you can really say that after 1795, it's, uh, it went down uh, not very gallantly. And uh, there was a, a, well, there was a long road of disasters until uh, 1813, I must say. Uh, there is a comment on Twitch. Such fascinating history. Uh, why don't we hear more about Dutch versus Anglo Wars? Uh, I believe there was even a movie about uh, part of it, right? Yeah, there was the uh, Yeah, there's a movie on the router there. And speaking of which, we have a question from Hetman Mazepa. Uh, and since we will be mentioning the name uh, time and again and again and again uh, today, uh, how prominent has uh, Admiral uh, Michel de Ruyter been in uh, Dutch naval history relative to other Dutch commanders? Does he occupy the same equivalent place as Nelson, uh, as, as Nelson does in the history of the Royal Navy? And is he still a popular figure today? So two things, I guess, in the naval and maritime history uh, facts, um, the right is absolutely the top admiral. He was, of course, also a very good tactician and a strategist in the 17th century, uh, doing all those battles, not only against uh, the English, but also to, against uh, the, the Swedish uh, during the Nordic Wars. Um, he was also a very uh, successful uh, financial manager, but that's, that's another story. Um, but I can, you can say that in naval, Dutch naval history, he, he's the big man. He, um, he's still, uh, a lot of ships have been named after him, but naval historians and Dutch historians, uh, more broad of you, uh, see him as the man of the, the Dutch Navy in the 17th century. And his name is still very famous. Uh, there was made a film of him, uh, let's say 15, 20 years ago, uh, that was the same as in England. Uh, was uh, who is the most famous Briton? Well, we had the who is the famous Dutch uh, Dutchman, and uh, he was not the first, but he was in the top ten then, even from the uh, most popular or most uh, significant uh, Dutch people, and that was uh, twenty years ago. And uh, yeah, yeah, I can, you can say that he's also some little bit of a, a Dutch Nelson, yes. Now, Dutch people are quite proud of their naval history and he's the icon of it, I would say. I've been to the Maritime Museum in Amsterdam as well. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, it, it was a, uh, it's also a very nice place to visit. If anyone vis visits Amsterdam, he should visit there. Especially, like I have to say, the, the visit to the East Indian Man, that uh, replica that's in the museum, that was an eye opener because just imagining several hundred of people squeezed in that tiny space for months. That 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 was kind of uh, well scary. <laughs> yeah, not impressive at the same time. And uh, such a ship, so that, that's quite uh, a scary thought. Yes, but but in the end, uh, when they came back to the Netherlands from the Dutch East Indies, uh, I must say, uh, mostly half of them had perished during the, the journey. Yeah, that's. Uh, we have a question from uh, Bulletin 90. Uh, what are or were some Dutch naval traditions unique to the Dutch Navy? Is there anything like specific, either to the Dutch Navy or specific to the Dutch military, like in well, general? I know one, and that's uh, there always has to be a ship named after Van Spike. Van Spike was a, a captain of a small ship in, in Antwerp and uh, during the uh, Belgian uh, Liberation War or independence uh, conflict, um, the, the Belgians tried to capture his ship and he said, uh, I'd rather blow myself up. And he did with all the people uh, trying to, to, to catch his ship. 
So to honor him, it's uh, the tradition that there is always one ship named in the Navy, uh, Van Spike. And sometimes it's a very small ship, tiny ship, but usually it's a frigate. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah. when did that happen? In uh, 1830. Okay. Yes. During the siege of uh, Antwerp. And uh, the rebelling class is quite right. At this moment, it's a uh, Dutch uh, M frigate. It was called uh, Van Spike. And, and indeed, it, it has always been Van Spike. And it's, it's even a royal order to have one. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, it's time we left the ancient history and moved to the more uh, contemporary times. I'll just quickly uh, put on a slideshow that will uh, slowly go in the back. Uh, because, uh, well, we've added the Dutch cruisers in the game and uh, the lower tiers uh, are actually ships that were built, that served and... Uh, that served even during uh, World War II, especially the cruisers uh, Java and the, uh, the Ruitre, uh, which uh, both uh, served and were sunk in the, well, probably well-known uh, Battle of the Java Sea. We uh, covered it in another installment of the Armchair Admirals. Uh, but uh, basically all of these uh, uh, cruisers uh, in uh, 19 uh, built in between 1900 and uh, 1930s uh, they all were kind of like uh, specific because they were built for uh, for the needs of the Netherlands navy which made them a bit I, I would say unique even in the concept so what what were the needs actually why were they built and how uh, how were they uh, built for like uh, what was their main uh, main purpose? The main purpose for them was, uh, as I told you earlier, that from the mid late nineteenth century onwards, the Dutch Navy was mostly concentrated in the Dutch East Indies. Uh, a lot of colonial goods, etc., came to the Netherlands. It was very important for the Dutch economy, and uh, of course, the Dutch fleet was not a big fleet, but it was uh, seen as very necessary in the time of imperialism, that there should be some sort of deterrent force. Uh, and so they had to uh, steam for long distances. They, uh, in some sort of way, they were most, more a uh, patrol ship, but armed enough to scare off uh, in the first line uh, possible uh, lone raiders to, to come into the, the Dutch uh, East Indies waters. So they, that was a, a deterrent for it. That was the main aim. And so they were all light cruisers and not heavy ships. And that was the main purpose uh, until uh, the mid 20s uh, for the Dutch policy uh, over there to scare off uh, possible intruders, not complete battle fleets, but that, that was a deterrent for it. Uh, they were uh, I mean, uh, they were fairly light for light cruisers even at that time. Yes. Uh, what uh, uh, like, uh, what was their main constraint? I mean, was it a need to have uh, more of them, or was it uh, budgetary reasons? Was it the size of the dry docks? What what played into the? Uh, well, uh, uh, as I said, we were of course a neutral state at that time, uh, so the the, the Dutch uh, government didn't want to be too militaristic in it. And, of course, it was the constraints of budget. Always a problem in the Netherlands, not only in the Netherlands, of course, but also the colonial army and uh, the, the Dutch army in the Netherlands also. But always a, a problem with money, money, money. And uh, so they put still in big... There. Still there, yes. But still there, there were big plans uh, for a bigger fleet, uh, 12 cru light cruisers, so they got six. Uh, four more armored uh, ships, so they got two, and in the end, four. But it was always a struggle to get more. They wanted uh, uh, 38 uh, destroyers, so you can guess, they only get 12. And that's always the same story. 
Uh, that uh, I mean that uh, probably ties also to a question we got from. Uh, okay, now I lost it. Uh, uh, but uh, basically, uh, why uh, uh, why they weren't more Trump class uh, ships uh, ordered instead of uh, the the Reuter? But if I'm reading the like the timeline correctly. The Trump was newer than the, the Reuter, newer design, so it basically was coming after that, and it had a different, like a different purpose, right? They were destroyer leaders rather than uh, full-on light cruisers. So right. they couldn't be called light cruisers because it was politically not sound. It sounded too aggressive. Yes, you, you can smile about that, but that was the main reason. Uh, they called them flotilla leaders, and they were still. Um, they had some sort still uh, used as light cruisers, but they couldn't be called like that because otherwise uh, the Dutch parliament wouldn't have agreed with it. So it was some sort of camouflage in words uh, to get the ships uh, at, the, at, the, at the end as well. Yeah. And uh, they I guess... it, it, it's something which the Dutch and the Royal Navies do quite a lot. They do camouflage uh, the British Royal Navy do, and the Dutch Royal Navy do quite a lot. And so does the Norwegian and the Swedish Royal Navies a lot. They camouflage things in words. Uh, with the Dutch, it's calling them flotilla leaders. Everyone knows you're using light cruisers for flotilla leaders because that's what the Navy all did during World War One, and were doing even pre prior to World War One, and even mostly into war period. But they were technically light cruisers because they weren't called light cruisers. Their purpose was to be flotilla leaders of grand destroyer flotillas. So they needed the space for the command staff and the flotilla duties. So, of course, they had to be light cruiser size, but they're flotilla leaders. It's like HMS Unicorn is not an aircraft carrier. She's a forward aviation support ship. That she looks like an aircraft carrier in no way means that she is one. Or HMS Invincible is a through deck cruiser, not an aircraft carrier. Uh, also, I suspect they're taking notes, thinking I can get a through deck cruiser for the Dutch Navy. This is going to be working on. <laughs> but that happens still today. I mean, yeah. our, our newest frigates are supposed to be named the destroyers, but we name them frigates. But they're yeah, the size of destroyer. Well, well let's be honest, our destroyers these days are the size of cruisers, but we don't call that. I mean, there's the Americans, the 14,000 ton Zumwalt class, which everyone's going around going, it's a destroyer. 14,000 tons? It's a destroyer? We have, of course, got well, uh, the Carl Burman at this moment. We call it a joint support ship, but it isn't a soul ship. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I suspect it's a also gorgeous the... one. Very spacious inside and not very comfortable. Good food. Uh, I suspect also the, the cruisers would uh, sound not only aggressive but also expensive, right? Uh, that, that's also true, but the, the main reason was to call them otherwise. That, that's the only uh, way to get them a little bit through. Mm. Yeah. Uh, how, how would they uh, measure up to basically other, uh, other navies, light, light cruisers? As in the, well, I, I mean, especially the British and the French and the Italians had the light, light categories from both sides. So how, how did the, the Reuter and Trump classes compare? Well, I, I, I guess that they were technically mostly, not, not all, I must say that the Reuter, the, the, the design with the single gun above the, the, the twin turret in the front, but uh, technically it, it was a disaster because it uh, gave a lot of instability and uh, you, you can re read about that, that uh, with maneuvers uh, and the first uh, expeditions with it and uh, maneuverability was bad. Um, the, the Trump class was uh, quite a good ship. Uh, it could have been faster, but uh, there were always some uh, slight problems over there. But the most uh, reason that there were technically problems, uh, technical problems, was uh, that uh, the Dutch didn't maneuver before the war a lot with them. Um, there was always there the problem with money. So large scale fleet maneuvers weren't there. So the, the ships couldn't, uh, well, couldn't be, f the, the officers on board of ships couldn't find out all the tricks and dirty tricks and problems with them until 18, of 1939. That was the main uh, problem for the Dutch. 
um, the, 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 where the officers themselves also were uh, used uh, with a single ship maneuver. And well, in the end, that became a problem later on working together in, in a larger force. And, uh, and they weren't used to have uh, several ships at the same time with uh, technical uh, problems. So that, that was a main uh, challenge for all of them. Uh, at the same time, uh, there was the, we already mentioned it, the Project uh, 1047, uh, which was basically, what was that supposed to be about? Because uh, it was uh, very similar to the German Scharnhorst class, but uh, uh, they were supposed to be, uh, what, battle cruisers, large cruisers? What were they supposed to fill? was already a very old plan in 1912, 1913 to have mm -hmm. nine uh, battleships for the Dutch Navy. Uh, okay. in the, it was all for the Dutch East Indies because from, well, let's say the, the Russian-Japanese uh, war onward, the Dutch were starting to get a little bit scared for Japan. And, uh, and they, uh, of course, saw that the, the Brits had their problems in Europe and that the Brits gave the Japanese the whole responsibility in the East. And they didn't like that a lot. So uh, they came on with a plan to build nine battleships. Um, and they Kaiser should have class. been... Kaiser-class battleships. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, there was a lot of uh, discussion with what kind of ships it had to be. We, we have uh, even found uh, uh, the blueprints of a uh, battleship uh, for Dutch, of a German design and kill from the uh, Germania Werft. And it had even uh, quadruple turrets, and uh, that was because uh, the port of Surabaya was too uh, narrow, and there was also at that moment already the problem of crew. Uh, but well, the First World War came, so no battleships, and in the 30s again there was talk of the Japanese scare, so they thought we have to have battleship uh, battle cruisers instead of battleships, and in the end they came to, uh, well, the design a Sharnas like because the Dutch had no experience with such large uh, uh, battle cruisers, so they came to forward to the, the Germans. But I must say, uh, only last year, uh, another a colleague of mine found out that the, the Dutch Prime Minister in spring 1939 even had the fantastic plan uh, he went to London, Colline, he was called, and he asked the British Admiralty if he could buy three old battleships uh, to bring over to the Dutch East Indies. So uh, bring in the cash and bring over the ships. And uh, it was only last year it was figured out. Yes, I, I can send you that. Uh, I can send you the articles. I believe it's in, it is in Dutch, but I can give you a, a short version of it. It might be interesting. Well, to, be fair, uh, that... to be fair, I think you were safe for trying to build your own battle cruisers and buying our class battleships. But it, it's nice to know that the money was being considered. The Royal Navy could have used it. I have to admit, uh, my thinking whenever looking at a Dutch fleet is that they are, in many respects, pursuing the best form of risk fleet strategy. Tirpitz managed to muck up the risk fleet idea by building it directly against Britain in a sort of challenge perspective. The Dutch were basically building a fleet that was going to cost whoever tried to take their empire enough in material that they couldn't fight anyone else. But wasn't so big, it could be used as a provocation and a casus belli. Because how could Japan complain about the Dutch having two or three battle cruisers sitting in the East Indies, uh, s sitting out there, when they have such a large navy? They can't. It looks childish. It's the same with the Americans and the Brits. No one could complain about it. But everyone knows if anyone tries to move in and take it, they're going to have to send battleships, which is going to weaken them fighting the Japanese or fighting the Americans or fighting the Brits. Whoever they are, whoever they're fighting, if they actually send ships to deal the Dutch, it's going to cost them in terms of resources, in terms of ships, in terms of material. And they might do things because the Dutch ships are not being designed to go down easy. They're not going to be something you're going to be able to roll over in a second. They're going to be crewed by very professional sailors, very professional officers. They might not have as much time to do group practice as they like, but they're still going to give a good account of themselves. 
because no one ever gets enough time to enough practice. No one gets enough money for exercises. Every time you talk to a treasury, the first thing they try and cut is the exercise budget because they go, well, we're not planning on a war next year, so why train for a war next year? And you go, you never plan for a war. It kind of happens on you. But that so that doesn't lo follow logically, but it sounds great logic to accountants, not logic to anyone else. So the Dutch, but the Dutch fleet, that is a, it is a risk fleet strategy that makes sense, and it could have been very successful if it had been gone through, because for the Japanese, and put put yourself in the Japanese position, if they send a fleet to take on the Dutch forces, then they have to weaken their fleets going elsewhere, or they have to support a multi action. Can they go and take on four C? Because if again, if the British had four C out there, and World War Two in the Far East in the Pacific had happened. The odds are the British battle, uh, the British fast battleship force would have kind of combined with the Dutch one. And who knows? The British might have actually sent a carrier out there, or eventually we can always dream the Dutch might have put their own carrier. But I know there weren't plans for that. But you can dream because a Dutch carrier would be pretty cool. That is an interesting new thing you bring forward. Uh, the Dutch Navy never, but never thought about a carrier before World War Two. The only one who thought about that, I wrote two articles on it, was the colonial army who were thinking about the Dutch carrier in the oh. East. That's funny enough that the Dutch Navy themselves never did until 1942. That's, uh, that's interesting. That actually answers the question from uh, Warmaster Boreas, who was asking exactly this, like, were there any thoughts about the carriers? So Only the army did, strangely enough. But, uh, Probably because they're started... being sensible about the infrastructure. Oh yes, that, that, that should have been a problem. Because in the Surabaya port, where the battle cruisers should have been uh, based, um, they were only starting to begin uh, uh, to make some place where the battle cruisers could have uh, docked. Uh, and that should have been finished only in at the earliest time around 1944. And that is a very optimistic uh, calculation. So it was only an early start to do that. And so that was uh, only on paper. It was very, quite interesting. That, that uh, there was, of course, uh, in the mid 30s, there was a lot of discussion should we have battle cruisers or cruisers at all instead of a big fleet of submarines? Uh, that was a large uh, strategic debate because uh, there was some uh, a lot of thought in the Dutch Navy to have some sort of wolf pack uh, submarine groups in the in the east, uh, thinking about uh, 45 until 70 Dutch submarines. In the end, in uh, 1931, there were only more or less modern uh, 24 Dutch uh, submarines over there. And most of them perished during the defense of Singapore. The Dutch uh, submarines, though, are something to look at in, again, in historical terms, because the Dutch, uh, it, it's kind of like, and I used this expression earlier, I'm not sure if I mentioned on live stream or pre-live stream, but when I was mentioning, I, I say the Italians are this navy you have to watch when you're talking about the Dreadnought era, because the Italians are actually pushing forward with the Dreadnought design a lot more than the Germans are, and in some respects the British responses are to the Italians and to the Americans in their design, rather than the Germans, because the Germans are churning out very similar ships again and again, so the British can afford to answer them the same, same. So the British only have to improve because other navies and the other navies making the jump are usually the Italians and the Americans. In some marines in the interwar period, it's the Dutch who are really pushing forward with a lot of the technology. And a lot of the later war stuff we associate with the German submarine force and go, this was them really pushing for their tech, is actually taken from the Dutch. It's you know the Dutch are really really into their submarines and it's sensible it's, again it's a this risk fleet strategy almost of what we're going to have there it's not going to stop you because there's nothing we can put there that's going to stop the entire thundering Japanese Navy or the inf entire thundering British Royal Navy or the entire thundering American Navy if they want to take it if they want to take it there is no way we can support a fleet which will be able to stop them. But we can have a fleet which is big enough, it's going to take a big enough bite out of you and require a large enough force of yours that is going to stop you being able to take on anyone else. And you're not going to want that. 
and that's one of the things they're pushing their submarines. And again, what I like about that, and of course the flying boats, the, the Dutch had about 80 flying boats, uh, Dornier and uh, PBI Catalina. So in total, they had in December, my photo uh, one had 80 of them, quite a lot. Yeah. And uh, also from what I've uh, seen, the Dutch submarines were doing very good in the initial months of the war in the Pacific. They were actually, they, they seemed to be one of the few uh, submarine forces that had torpedoes that worked. So, Yes, they, 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 they destroyed uh, two Japanese destroyers with it and a lot of uh, Japanese cargo ships. And uh, well, later in the war, they even uh, managed to, to sink uh, two German U-boats. And an Italian uh, U-boat, but, but uh, especially in the first weeks of the Asiatic War, they did quite well. And uh, one of the uh, the captains of the submarines uh, became prime minister. Oh uh, yes. Oh. Six. Really? <laughs> yep. With a fantastic name, Pete de Jong. You can't yeah. get them more Dutch. So. Uh, there is a question from uh, Little215. Uh, how did the Dutch Empire, especially the Navy in the Far East, maintain, find, fund and sustain itself with the Netherlands under German occupation and the government in exile? How did it work? Well, as I told you already, the, the, the Dutch uh, in the Dutch East Indies, they made a lot of money from the colonial goods. Uh, after the occupation by the Germans, uh, those goods were sent over to the Allied zones and to the Americas. They got some money of it, but I have to be uh, quite frankly about it. Uh, a lot of money they uh, get over there to, to pay for, for the whole infrastructure, the fleet, uh, the government, etc. Uh, they borrowed the money from the from the Brits and the Americans. Uh, so there was some, uh, still some, uh, they, uh, they gained some own money, but most of them was borrowed from the Americans and the Brits. And the Brits, of course, borrowed a lot of the Americans, etc. Yeah, uh, I believe the there were... And the Australians and the yeah. South Africans and the <laughs> Indians and pretty much... Yeah, they, we, were we were borrowing from everyone. Come on. Yeah. Uh, I believe there were also several destroyers from the that were transferred from the Royal Navy to the uh, Dutch Navy. That's uh, HMS Nonpare and uh, a few others. And uh, also there was this uh, one of the Trump, uh, the second of the Trump class uh, that was uh, actually completely unarmed when it managed to escape from uh, then Helder to Britain and uh, was then rearmed in Britain, right? Well, it, it had arms, it had guns, but uh, 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 weapon systems, who had, uh, the, the Brits had no weapon systems for them and also... Uh, ah, okay. So... Uh, the, the Dutch uh, guns were brought over elsewhere and they put a lot of uh, anti-aircraft guns on it. So the, the Jakob von Heemskerk was in fact an uh, anti-aircraft uh, cruiser, it became. Ah, so it was a very similar case to the Polish Bliskawica that also and underwent the same. Uh, you also have to remember that the Dutch not only give tech to the Germans who captured it, but also to the Brits in the terms of the haze mare and various other systems of, of radar control guns. And without the Dutch, the radar controlled anti-aircraft guns, which the British are later putting in during World War II, and become critical to some of the later battles in the Mediterranean and the Pacific, would have not been there. The Dutch give us a three, four year head start on where we were. And it's even more critical for the Americans because they look at them and go, what? We didn't realize you could do this. And then they develop it and push forward, of course, in the way the Americans can afford to and can because <clears throat> of their large industrial base. But it was all thanks to the Dutch who were developing all this technology because of their strategy. Far East, excuse me a second. Yeah, especially the, uh, for example, the the, the Dutch anti-aircraft guns on, on board of the De Ruyter, the light the cruiser De Ruyter, who, uh, who, who sunk in uh, 1942 in the Battle of the Alpha Sea. Uh, their anti-aircraft guns uh, on board of the Trump. The Americans were quite uh, surprised by it to find out that 
the fire control systems were, as 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 he said, they were a lot of more were more modern than the American ones. So the allies uh, on that very niche, uh, well, they gained a lot of uh, experience in the, with it, and they put it on their own uh, ships, uh, aircraft, etc. The good thing about the Dutch is when they turn up, they not they don't just bring the equipment with them; they bring the scientists with them as well, and the engineers who know how to use it and maintain it. And that's really, really good and really, really useful because it really allows you to push forward things. Yeah, so there are also some Dutch uh, ship designers who were working in the in the known uh, British Navy uh, office in Bath with them, and they brought also their knowledge with them. Uh, there's a question from Sangloon on Twitch. Uh, I heard the Dutch had to do some commitments uh, to defending Singapore in exchange for protection. Anything more about that? Um, well, as I said, the, a lot of Dutch uh, submarines uh, were sunk during the uh, uh, defense of Singapore because, uh, well, it, there was some sort of uh, uh, exchange of when you help defend uh, Singapore, uh, we will help uh, to defend Java. In the end, well, uh, the Dutch suffered uh, quite some losses in December, early January around Singapore. Uh, not only uh, submarines, but also uh, quite a few uh, mm. uh, flying boats, etc., uh, etc. Et and in the end, well, there's the irony, of course, that after the fall of Singapore, the <laughs> Dutch were hoping that the Brits would send in a lot of reinforcements to Java. But they didn't arrive because uh, the, the Brits were pulling out most of their forces which were left to India or to Australia and not to Java because uh, realistic as they were, they said, well, Java is lost without Singapore. So they didn't put a lot of reinforcements over there. They didn't at all. The only one who sent a little bit of reinforcements were the Australians, a little bit of uh, the Americans. But especially the Americans said, we will fight with you to the end, but we will decide ourselves what the end is. So, uh, but the, the, you are right that the promise sort of was that the Dutch would help the Brits in Singapore and the Brits would help the Dutch in Java. But in the end, it didn't work. But that's in reality is because if you could have held Singapore, you could have held Java and you could have with secured the, the entire Java, area. Yeah. And as we all know, the fall of Singapore is completely and utterly silly because the Japanese army is actually running out of food. And if the British had put, I don't know, a couple of battalions of troops in the protection of the, of the reservoirs, which they'd dug in and put proper defensive positions for, the Japanese probably wouldn't have got control of the water supply on Singapore. So it might well have been forced to withdraw through lack of food. And then you'd have ended up with a Malta of the Far East scenario, perhaps, in Singapore. But it would have been a Malta of the Far East, which would have stopped the Japanese gaining access to the Indian Ocean. It would have stopped the famine in India. It would have been a protection for Australia, protection for Java, protection for all sorts of things. And they all move into the area to, to retake the Philippines. So, like Malta, it would have been worth it so, they'd have, so people would have found the resources to support it. Yes, it's in a quite... The in uh, interesting iffy story around the uh, Malaya bear. Uh, we have uh, almost uh, eight o'clock uh, right now, so I guess we will have to do our uh, guest switcheroo. Uh, so I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Uh, van der Pet uh, for his uh, uh, visit and uh, for his information. And I, for one, would definitely be interested uh, in the article about the uh, uh, proposal to purchase the uh, R-class battleships, because that's yes. uh, never heard about it before, and it sounds fascinating. Uh, so and that could uh, be a whole new Dutch line. What would a uh, Dutch upgraded R-class battleship be like? <laughs> you can't imagine they'd have left them alone. They'd have upgraded them. Oh, yeah. That, that could be the start of the Dutch battleship line. Who knows? Who knows? But I uh, will surely uh, keep in contact with you and send you uh, some information. On it. Absolutely. Gentlemen, it was a pleasure. See you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.
Have Bye. a nice day Bye. and uh, thank you. And I'll now switch quickly into the break so that we can do the technical shenanigans. Be right back. And we are back. Uh, did it work? Oh, it did work seamlessly. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, welcome back, people. Uh, we are back after a short technical break. And as you can see, uh, we had to uh, rotate uh, 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 Dr. Van der Pitt, uh, out because he had uh, other commitments. And uh, that allowed us to slot uh, our uh, ever favorite uh, Drachenifel <laughs> in for the second half of the stream. Hello, Mr. Drakenifel. Hello. And just for the few people who might still not uh, know who you are, please uh, drop a short introduction. Uh, so I run the uh, YouTube channel Drakenifel, um, the Twitter account Drakenifel, and the website Drakenifel. It's uh, naval history, mostly 1850 to 1950, but goes a little bit further back. And uh, yeah, you, you can't get rid of me that easily. I'm here to stay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there, there were actually people asking about you in the mm -hmm. in the chat uh, uh, earlier. So I mm. I promise that you will be back, and uh, so you are. Yeah, I am here. So to uh, open the second uh, second part of the stream, I'll go quickly back to this uh, slideshow where we have a, a mix of pictures provided by uh, Drachenifel and by. Uh, class. Uh, so, uh, what we can he see here, I, generally, it seems that there are some pretty old ships. I take it uh, one of them, at least, is the coastal defense ship that's uh, currently in Den Helder, right? The the monitor. Uh, uh, no, I actually I kept Scorpion uh, out of the out of ah, the rotation okay. specifically. Oh, Scorpion I... is the name. Yeah, I, I yes. just couldn't recall the name. I I knew that it was some animal. Uh, yeah, it's, but, uh, uh, it's still there, but I've got plenty of color photos from my visit to Ten Helder, so um, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm keeping those. <laughs> There's a few black and whites of it in service, but unfortunately, the, the ones I've got in this particular album for Scorpion and Buffel are not the clearest, whereas I was trying to take some of the uh, slightly clearer photos. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, some of the pictures uh, I uh, cannot really isolate them uh, here because of our technical limitations, but uh, mm -hmm. were provided by uh, by class. And uh, there was a, some interesting uh, interesting story. Let me ch check whether that specific picture is here. If not, I will edit quickly. Uh, but basically there were uh, two ships uh, side, by, uh, side by side during the war. Where do I have them? Here. Yes. 
Of course, uh, while, while you're looking for those pictures, I do have to ask uh, Class: Have you seen the movie A Knight's Tale? No, not really. Fair enough. I I I won't uh, I won't inflict the chant then. <laughs> I have to. Uh, there, 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 there's a very good. Um, well, in, at least in my opinion, a very good uh, movie, a medieval hit movie starring the late Heath Ledger, um, where he pretends to be a knight. He is uh, Sir Ulrich von Lich Lichtenstein from Gelderland, which makes no sense geographically. Um, no, no, there's no. No, but I mean, it's it's a hilariously funny movie, but there, it, the whole thing's done in the, almost in the style of an English football crowd. So when, it, when I saw the uh, tier two... Dutch cruiser, obviously Gelderland, and um, obviously the pictures of it that are cycling through here occasionally. I was semi tempted to come on just chanting Gelderland, 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 as they do in the movie. <laughs> but I've done that anyway. Yeah, so, uh, South Africa, because uh, the Gelderland, or we say Gelderland, mm -hmm. uh, went to South Africa, I think in 1901, to help. Oh, Mozambique, actually, to help mm -hmm. uh, escape Paul Kruger, mm -hmm. who uh, had to flee from the British in the South African uh, area and yeah. brought him to Europe. So that's, okay. I think, the, the main um, achievement of the, the ship in, in, in history. It, of course, it did a lot of other things. Mm. And one of the things um, I would like to mention is that the Gelderlands, but also the Jacob van Heemskerk and the Hertog Hendrik, which were all old ships, 1898, 1906, 1904. So at the start of World War II, these were really obsolete ships. But the Germans, uh, they gave them a second life and changed them into flagships. And uh, like the, the, the Jacob van Heemskerk, uh, this 1906 ship uh, defended uh, the, the very modern rocket site Peenemünde uh, mm. against uh, air attacks. And yeah, I, I have to apologize for a, a slightly uh, weird uh, way of displaying this. And the image itself is uh, obviously taken mm -hmm. from an uh, old photo, so it's fairly small. But I believe those are those ships, right? The anti-aircraft... Yeah, yeah. uh, that, I think that's the, uh, the Ariadne, you have the Jundin and you have the Niobe. And uh, they all had a second uh, German life during World War II with uh, very heavy flak uh, guns. Uh, I think uh, 105 millimeter guns on it. And uh, they had a second life. And uh, the Hertha Hendrik even had a third life because um, after the war it was changed in an accommodation ship uh, so that people could live on it and it served until 1968 so it served like uh, 46 years which is quite a, a long time for such a ship yeah uh, there is a question about world war one from the really good man uh, did germany take over dutch naval assets or did the dutch navy sail away to fight under the british flag I believe in World War One, neither of that was necessary, right? Because uh, the Netherlands were neutral. We stayed uh, neutral. Yeah, but uh, was there any uh, was there any effect the World War One had on the on the Netherlands? Uh, did uh, like uh, were Netherlands affected by the blockade against Germany uh, or? Yes, we were. Uh, there, there was a blockade, so there was uh, a lot of uh, scarcity uh, in goods. But still, uh, life wasn't that uh, bad compared to the, the other countries around us. Mm -hmm. But uh, from a naval point of view, the the worst thing that happened was that because of the war, we couldn't order our dreadnoughts, which we wanted to 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 order in uh, in Germany. But because of the, the the First World War, it wasn't possible anymore to to order these big ships we, we wanted to use in the, in the east. Um, yeah, and also... the, the the Dutch Navy ma managed to end up with a few uh, additional ships because d at various points during the war, both uh, German and 
British ships ended up going aground or finding themselves uh, crippled or otherwise without power in, in either in Dutch waters or actually on Dutch shores. So uh, obviously as uh, acting as true neutral, the Dutch said, well, yeah, you know, they're ours now. <laughs> you can't have them back until the war's over. <laughs> well, actually, our Air Force had a lot of uh, new planes in mm. those years because uh, of all those ships, that, of all those uh, aircraft that landed in, in Holland. Yeah, uh, I, I believe uh, the Swedish and the Swiss were in a similar situation during the World War II. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, there is a, actually quite a lot of questions about one very fascinating piece of uh, history, and that's the minesweeper Abraham Kring, uh, <laughs> Krinsen. <laughs> you have just uh, as yes. much problem with it as me. <laughs> yes, I do. Krinsen. Krenzen. 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 Ah, yeah. So uh, what uh, what happened there? Well, um, this it was a, a minesweeper, and it was one of the last ships still uh, in the Dutch Indies area. And uh, after the, the the fall of the Dutch Indies, uh, it, it had to escape. But of course, there were a lot of. Uh, Japanese activity going on in the in the air and on on the sea. So the the captain of the ship decided to uh, change the ship in, into an island uh, with all kinds of of trees and and, and and leaves and even those parts which couldn't be covered with with trees, they were painted with like it looked like rocks, and it would sail at night. And over days, it would, uh, yeah, more uh, against uh, between the islands, and that way it got safely uh, back to Australia, and it served uh, the war after that, and it also served during the war, the decolonization war in the Dutch Indies, and today you can visit this ship in Den Helder. It's now in Den Helder. It's a museum ship. It's Although, sadly, small. they've taken away the island camo, so you can actually yes. see it. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I've been to, to the ship, and uh, it's uh, surprisingly small and surprisingly large at the same time, kind of. Like, like w w every, every time when you hear a minesweeper, you imagine it like a, some, some tiny ship. When you are on board, it's actually quite large, but still, compa especially compared to the submarine next doors... <laughs> Mm. Even though I, I think the submarine has a bit of a altitude advantage as well. It's, for those of you who were not in the museum, the submarine is actually in the air, so kind of dominating yeah. the entire area. Yeah, ships always look a lot bigger once they've been uh, hauled out of the water. You forget just how much depth there actually is to e even a small ship. Right. Yeah. Okay, so... Um... Uh, so let me check. Uh, I had a question picked up here, but I can't uh, find it. In there. Ah, yeah, uh, here, Mad Mad Max Math. Uh, it's uh, kind of uh, just to expand on the question we we had earlier. How did the Dutch Navy actually operate uh, during World War Two after the uh, mainland uh, was uh, occupied? Uh, so. Uh, from whom did the Dutch Navy in the Pacific uh, Theater get their orders uh, from? So I believe the Dutch uh, exile government was in Britain, right? Yes. But there was still a government in uh, in the Dutch Indies, which was, of course, loyal to, to London. And uh, we had uh, also a headquarters, I think, in, in Colombo, in Ceylon, and there was a headquarters in, in Australia. And so we were closely together with the British and the Australians and the Americans. Yeah, yeah there was actually another fascinating, uh, let's say, small ship story uh, uh, that uh, captivated me already as, uh, when, when I was young because there was a, uh, this uh, nice book covering all various like episodes of the uh, of the naval warfare, and uh, that was that of the. Uh, Indian minesweeper Bengal and the Dutch uh, oiler Ondine. Ondina? Ondine? 
uh, that were ambushed by two Japanese surface ra- raiders in the Indian Ocean and actually managed to, against all odds, win, uh, sinking uh, one of the raiders and uh, making the other go away. Uh, which, I, I mean, that happened, I've, I believe, in late 1942, and it, it just shows that the area was anything but safe for a long, long time. I mean, there was also the second Indian Ocean raid in 1944, and uh, so I believe that uh, all the surviving uh, Dutch Navy ships in the area had quite a lively career. I think some of them participated even in the invasion to Madagascar. <clears throat> the Dutch Navy get involved in a lot of World War Two. There is a reason why... Basically, if you want to find the Dutch destroyers or the Polish destroyers, you tend to have to look for the tribal class destroyers, and they'll tend to be hanging out together and doing really kind of random hair-raising things. It's There's a Dutch destroyer along when the Royal Navy take out two Italian light light sort of destroyers on cruiser sized vessels uh and you the know they get, they ambush it the isaac swears i think is along the, along yeah, the yes. and they, yes. they, they, they they take them out of cape bond and the, the the dutch like to turn up in these little fights it's kind of like um there's another navy going on uh, going along here flip a coin is it the dutch or the polish if they, it, 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 the, if it's in europe or anywhere it's going to be one or the other Occasionally, the Australians and the Canadians turn up, but usually, if there's another destroyer which is tacked onto some British tribal class destroyers or any of the British large destroyers going off on an operation, it will be Dutch or it will be Polish. And they will be relied upon, very much integrated into the force, and very much considered one of the team. And they will be doing the fighting as hard as they can. Whereas there were other Allied navies who, let's be honest, the rest of the Allied navies were sort of going, convoy duty. You, your convoy duty, you haven't yet sort of, you were not quite sure whether you know what you're doing. The Polish and the Dutch, always there. And always scary. I mean, seriously, the, 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 the Isaac Swears the, was the one which came closest to ramming the Italian cruisers on that evening, if I remember the, if I'm remembering it correctly. Uh, it, that was some pretty hair-raising and skillful shipment uh, shipmanship. And uh, don't don't and also you know don't forget we've got um, things like the Flores class gunboats. Oh, I think that's how they're pronounced. Mm-hmm. The the Flores and the Sumba. Mm. These were gun- gunboats which supported the the landings in uh, S- Sicily and uh, on D-Day. Yeah, and yeah. and it's it, it is quite interesting because you know the the clues in the name they are gunboats. So you're talking about shore bombardment operations where you've got heavy cruisers and battleships flinging shells left, right, and centre, and then in the middle of it you've got a relatively diminutive pair of gunboats running around also providing quite enthusiastic fire support and actually very very accurate fire support because their nature as gunboats means that they've got heavier guns than the destroyers but in some cases they're actually able to get almost as close in as some of the destroyers can so they're able to put heavy relatively heavy fire down from fairly close positions which means fairly accurately so they were quite popular with a lot of the allied troops not only that, like if you if it's fighting in both Sicily and at D-Day, that's a long way to travel for a gunboat. Like mm. you, you've got to get it there. They're not exactly if it's worth it, you make the effort. Yeah. <laughs> yeah plus, well, I believe also more motivated because their country was occupied. That usually helps. Same yeah. for the yeah. Yeah. plus. Mm. Uh, I guess they were more open sea gunboats, right, for the duty in the. Uh, in the colonies, so you still need to cross uh, cross open sea, not just uh, coastal uh, coastal gunboats. Kind of like the uh, what was the French name for that category? Aviso, mm-hmm. basically sloop, right? The... Yeah, and, and I mean this is I think as as Klaus mentions there, this is a a point you have to remember with all of the navies of the occupied countries. They they're very self-selecting in terms of the motivation of people because if you 
have your country taken over. Okay, fair enough, you might not have been able to get out, but if you are able to escape before the Germans take over, you have a lot of choices on your hands. You could go and sort of live out the war in an unoccupied country. You could go into the merchant navy. Um, and so for people in, so for example, the Dutch navy, they have not only escaped uh, Germany, Germany's occupation of, of the Netherlands themselves, or they've possibly been in the in the Dutch East Indies at the time, um, but they've then chosen to continue specifically either to continue serving or to enlist and serve in the Dutch Navy. So it's a much more motivated core of people, if you like, um, in the in the navies who've had their homelands occupied. Plus, of course, they're fighting to free their homelands than you would get in some of the other navies. Now, of course, that's not to say the navies of the Royal Navy, US Navy, etc. aren't fighting hard. But there is that additional level of motivation when, you know, that every shell that you're flinging down range is one shell closer to, to getting your country back. And the the ships in the Dutch uh, East Indies, they were a mixed, uh, they had mixed crews. So Dutch crews and Indonesian crews. And I think they were both equally uh, motivated. Which I think it was quite unique to have a mixed crew. Mm. In those yeah, days. Uh, yeah, in those days you don't you don't see it show up. Yeah, I, I guess it was probably very similar to the uh, Indian uh, to the Royal Indian Navy with uh, typically or often British uh, higher officers and uh, Indian crew for the for the rest of the ship, right? That's mm. yes, but the Royal Indian Navy was. Uh... Very much a sloop specialist navy. They had yeah. some very, very good ships, though, and they did a lot of very interesting things in terms of mine sweeping and anti submarine warfare and various other options they get up to. So the Royal Indian Navy is something quite cool, but they don't get enough press about what they do in World War II, and really there isn't enough being published yet about it to talk about them in depth. We, have, we are lucky in that the Dutch have slightly more publications about it, what happens with the Royal Indian Navy is that, of course, after World War II, not long afterwards, there is partition, which breaks up some of the crews and some of the pe some of the personnel, and you have some go one side and some go the other, and then you have the various wars of partition, which do involve navies, where unfortunately some of those crew who served died, but some of us make their names to themselves, and it's politically, uh, in that period, far more sensible for them to concentrate on their latter career than their world war ii career shall we say and so the information you can sometimes find out on the world war ii career of the royal indian navy is quite sparse but it's getting better there are some brilliant indian naval historians who are working on it and i enjoy following them on twitter i cannot remember their names and handles at the moment i'm sorry i apologize i have been driving for several hours today um, but um, they are very, very good. Perhaps uh, someone who's got better internet connection than me can do a quick Twitter search. Uh, there was a question, but I actually can't uh, find it now, uh, aiming at the uh, Battle of Java Sea. Ah, yeah, uh, from Black Ivy 74 uh, Well, not specifically Java Sea, but uh, if the Dutch fought independent from uh, Abda Command, would could they have stood up the Japanese better? I think that's a that's a very like <laughs> a mixed question, I guess. Uh, from my point of view, probably not. But uh, uh, because after all, there is a strength in numbers. But on the other hand, given the fair disorganization of the Abda command, could it have gone better if uh, the navies uh, operated separately at that moment or not? Um, not really, because of the whole point of, of a BDA command was that no single navy had enough ships present to really stand off against the Japanese. The Americans had effectively what was left of the Asiatic squadron after the Philippines, 
and they weren't really rushing to reinforce that because they were still dealing with the aftermath of Pearl Harbor. Um, the British had plenty of lovely plans filed away for how they were going to deal with the Pacific War for Japan and found themselves fighting Germany and Italy and so somewhat critically short of ships. Um, the Australians were pretty much the only ones who had anything close to their originally planned force there. Uh, and even for them, they had a few ships that were over in the Mediterranean and other ships like Sydney that had been lost. And as we've been discussing, you know, that the Dutch had the ships that were available in the Dutch East Indies, but some of the other ships they would have preferred to bring in from the Netherlands now weren't available because of the Netherlands being occupied. So no one had, with the possible exception of the Australians, anything close to what they'd anticipated having in the area. Uh, in the event of a war with Japan, and so the, those individual forces, on their own, they would have just been picked off one by one by the Japanese. The other, the other problem, to be honest, is that it's not just numbers; it's also the types of ships. Because when you look at something like the Battle of the of Java Sea, on paper, the number of ships, at least in terms of the heavy ships, could be seen to be almost the same. But then when you look at the capabilities, you realize that the Japanese have shown up with all all big ships all over, um, at least in terms of the modern ones, all well over 10,000 tons because, you know, treaties more like guideline to them. Um, and most of the ABDA ships are smaller ships well under 10,000 tons with um, the exception during the ABDA command phase of uh, USS Houston. And they're all physically smaller, so they, on paper they wouldn't stand up in a one-on-one -on -one fight anyway, let alone um, if they're isolated and outnumbered. Of course, the real problem for the Abda command was they hadn't practiced together. If you had managed, if they managed to do some exercises pre-war, if they, I don't know, had so, uh, managed to arrange more than just the occasional visiting exercises. And this is one of the interesting things when I, you know, in 19, January 1939, HMS Birmingham and two sloops are down in the East, in, uh, down in the sort of the East Indies area, do, going through Java Sea, exercising with the Dutch, exercising with the Australians. When Birmingham and one of the sloops is called up to Singtel to deal with the uh, SS Vincent de Paul incident. As an incident of all, and the the, the the various the things which happened there at Singtao. The thing is, that was a very ad hoc thing. That was basically naval diplomacy going on. And really, he, this is the one plank sort of missing, I would say, from the Dutch risk fleet strategy for defence of their east of their empire is that they needed to have done some practices. And the Commonwealth, the British Commonwealth, and the, the British Empire, the Commonwealth, and the, the way it structured its navies, it could get away with it in a way because they all trained together and they all had big exercises. But you needed the Dutch to work with someone, uh, need, needed to sort of work with someone else if they were going to have ability. And the British need to have worked with the Dutch and the Americans needed to work it. And really it, it could only have been the dutch who could have done that as a joint exercise and calls people although of course if they really wanted to be clever they'd have had to invite the japanese as well which might have been a very interesting exercise to have been hosting in i don't know 1940 to have invited the british the uh, japanese and the americans to a joint naval exercise in southeast asia i i, I i'm not sure how well that would have gone down but it could have been fun but the thing is, by about 1940, they're already fighting alongside the British in Europe, uh, organizing a joint exercise. So at least the British and the Dutch are used to working together in the Far East would have seemed a sensible thing to have pushed for if you've been the Dutch government. You can understand why they don't. They're kind of busy. There is a lot else going on, so you can understand why they don't. But if at least the Dutch and the British and the Australians and New Zealanders had worked together then you'd only been slotting the Americans into a command structure, and ABDA could have been far more effective, because half the problems with ABDA, ABDA is it's so quickly thrown together, and it's everyone working out how they're going to communicate and work together. And yes, on paper, they are certainly weaker than their Japanese counterparts, 
but if you'd had more familiarity at command and control, they do have some abilities which could have enabled them to pull off some nasty surprises, if not actually win. Apparently from uh, Turk Frost, the uh, H&M LMS, uh, Evertsen is currently with uh, Carrier Strike Group 21 in the South China Sea. Yes. Uh, just to uh, keep uh, things in the Southeast Asia. <clears throat> uh, there is a question that I actually don't know what it actually means, but it's specifically for class. So uh, I hope uh, you will understand what uh, Hellspiker means. Uh, question for Klaus Meyer. Which is your pick? Piet Hein or the Reuter? Which? Uh, Piet Hein. Piet Hein or the Reuter? Piet Hein, yes. Yeah. Well, I think uh, the Reuter is, is, is bigger. Piet Hein, he was uh, lucky in, 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 in conquering uh, a Spanish uh, fleet full of silver. But it was not so much of a really uh, naval battle. But he, he was uh, quite lucky uh, to find the, this fleet, Spanish fleet, which had a lot of silver inside. Um, so now Pitain is not as big as, as, as the writer, I would say. No, okay. I guess a follow-on question on that would be um, one of our one of our cruiser names that we've picked um, for one of our design cruisers is uh, is. Um, we have no idea how to pronounce it. And if we could get your help with this class, um, I think it's uh, Kijtku Duin. Um, Kijk Dun. So, Kijk Dun. Kijk Dun. Kijk Dun. Oh, okay. Kijk Dun. That's that's easier than I thought. <laughs> it's a very intimidating spelling. I, I mean, still still not easy, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, there is a question that's uh, more like. I would say free format from again from the really good men. Uh, are there any favorite exploits by the free Dutch Navy you would like to bring up uh, during uh, World War II? So, I guess uh, I can uh, I can start with mine, even though I already uh, mentioned it. So for me, it was the uh, Euler uh, Ondina alongside with the HMIS uh, Bengal. Uh, fighting of successfully the uh, pair of uh, Japanese armed merchant riders. Uh, so, anyone else has any uh, interesting episode? Maybe uh, the yep. uh, HNLS uh, Sumatra cruiser, um, which was not very successful uh, because of technical problems during the war, but it had one major uh, contribution to the to the war. Uh, because after Operation Overlord, of course, it was necessary to build a harbor, a Mulberry Harbor. And this beautiful uh, cruiser Sumatra was brought over there and, and was uh, sunk on purpose to be able uh, to have an artificial reef so you could construct uh, the Mulberry Harbor, which was very important for the success of uh, Operation Overlord. Uh, she was a sister of uh, the Java, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's uh, actually not not the only cruiser that ended up you know, in the. the, the think those guns on the Sumatra, they went over to the the Flores class gunboats because yeah. they had already uh, fired so many shells there. Their their guns were uh, worn out. Uh, that's uh, uh, actually pretty cool recycling there, but uh, yeah, Sumatra wasn't actually the only cruiser even that uh, ended in those. Uh, uh, wave breakers. There was also the uh, Polish Polish uh, Airpad Dragon that was uh, damaged by the German midget submarine and uh, had to be uh, scuttled there. Also, okay. Also, one of the um, Corbet class battleships also was um, expended, if I remember correctly. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I one. would. So, mine. Yeah. For doing it is going to be the Isaac Swears again. Because I love that destroyer. She does... She has a shortish career in terms of World War II. She does get sunk by a German submarine, but she actually does something very cool. Even cooler than Battle of Cape Bon, where she does some really, really naughty stuff 
especially if you are the Alberta de Gasano. Um, in January 1942, she's part of a convoy called MW8B, which, as, seen, as you can guess from designation, is going to Malta. And the L-class destroyer, HMS Gurkha, which is named for the HMS Gurkha, the travel-class destroyer, which sank earlier in World War II, charging an air attack to drive the, the air attack off the troop convoy. It sacrificed itself, but the whole convoy got through. Anyway, Gurkha is torpedoed by U-133. And because one of the oil tankers in the convoy has also been hit... Isaac Schweers first has to go through a burning oil field to reach the Gurkha, then attaches a tow line and tows her out. We literally, with fire going on all the sea around them, all sorts of smoke, under attack, tows this destroyer out to rescue 240 sailors on that destroyer. And I just think that's that's just amazing. That's a movie scene that's never going to be made because it's a Dutch and a British destroyer. And let's be honest, no American Hollywood <laughs> types are going to invest in that. But that imagine the scene. You literally, you're driving your destroyer through a burning ocean. Absolute conflagrations going on everywhere. It's You cannot under, uh, put any limit on how much fire you are seeing, how much smoke... And there's air attacks going on to save another destroyer, which is stricken, which actually behind a smoke and fire, you don't know, might not actually be still afloat. But you're going in after anyway. You get it. You attach a tow line on and then you have to tow it out. And it can't do it itself because it's so damaged. And that's a a massive feat of, of sailor of sailing and sailor ship uh, sailor skills. But B, it's a ma huge bravery by the whole crew. Because let's yes. be honest, you're going, you're literally driving a sh something which is loaded with explosives into a great big bonfire. Come on, that's brave. That definitely is. That's <laughs> my my personal candidate. I mean, apart from obviously the, the the minesweeper whose name I cannot possibly hope to pronounce, <laughs> um, is the actually the a Dutch submarine um, O21, which has a very fun little game of cat and mouse with a German U-boat, because it's trying to make its way home. Um, I think it's becoming back to Gibraltar actually, and they notice they're being followed by a German uh, a German U-boat, and you have this very prolonged game of kind of because the O21 doesn't fit the profile of you know a standard. British submarine because it isn't one um, the U-boat captain is trying to get just that little bit closer to verify who exactly is he's trailing because the last thing you want on your record is in a in the Kriegsmarine is yeah you know one of my fellow captains was was very sneakily sneaking towards Gibraltar and then I blew him out of the water because I thought he was an enemy enemy um, but the Dutch captain is a little bit faster in working out that U95 is hostile than U95 is in working out who O21 is so the Dutch captain fires a couple of torpedoes back at its pursuer and, again, is rather smart about it in that the two torpedoes are fired on slightly diverging courses, which means that U-95 sees the first torpedo and goes, right, um, OK, I'm, I'm going to dodge this, turns, turns straight into the path of the second torpedo. Um, and thus becomes, uh, that, that means O-21 joins a relatively rare club, of submarines that have managed to successfully engage and kill other submarines and from that it's in an even more exclusive club of submarines that engage and killed other submarines in active combat situations when both sides knew the other was there because in the in the relatively small group of submarines that have killed other submarines the vast majority have been ambushes when the victim didn't have the first clue that the attacker was actually present um as you can appreciate you know with straight running um, fixed depth non-homing torpedoes it's actually very difficult to kill another submarine especially if they're bow on but O21 managed it so um, I, I quite like that particular achievement um, I have to go with Abdu Command um, so you have De Reuter and you have um, Java uh, and as well as a few other um, ships there I mean the whole 
trials and tribulations of that whole event series of events is um is, it's dramatic and it's um you know, dramatic and traumatic in a, in a way and so like it's there's feats of seamanship, there's mistakes and there's lessons learned um and all of which keep going and keep going and so it's really kind of almost the baptism of fire that doesn't get talked about for the for the um american navy especially for the cruiser forces um, so it's a, it's it's an important one, and the Dutch are a huge part of that. So, uh, speaking of uh, uh, um uh, of uh, Dutch submarines, there seems to have been also some interaction between the uh, USS Kurt and the submarine O nineteen. But yeah, that's uh, the, I'm. I think that's yeah. the only uh, rescue mission of a submarine by another submarine because uh, that submarine got stuck on a uh, reef and they couldn't get it off. And then U.S. Scott came along and, and, and saved the crew. That's the only time I think that happened in history that uh, one submarine saved the crew of another submarine. Mm. Uh, there seems to have been a permanent reminder of uh, that event and especially of the party that followed uh, by the by both crews after reaching port in the form of a martini glass being permanently placed on the USS Cod uh, Conning Tower. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, yeah I mean, there's color footage of this rescue operation. Oh. Quite yeah. interesting to see. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, from from the spreadsheet of, of questions we had beforehand, I think it, you know some people in the in the chat pointing out where's it gone. Someone saying, oh, "Yeah, what I'm getting from this is Dutch sailors and ship commanders are superb and hardcore." And yeah, that's the, that kind of ties into this uh, question that Skeltran asked, which he said the Dutch Navy is one of the few in the world who beat the British Navy at war, scoring significant victories compared to contemporary powers such as France or Spain. England's great rivals at sea. What was it about the Dutch Navy in the early Republic it defended that allowed it to defeat at sea a powerful naval nation like England when larger nations like Spain and France could not? I think it's it's a good it's a good sort of way of segueing into that question because one of the things that, at least in my opinion, you've got to remember is that the Dutch back then, and obviously to to degree going forward into World War Two, were a maritime nation. They they were a land the sort of the country itself. Yes, it was part of Europe, part of the the continent of Europe, and therefore had a lot of concerns with land based attacks. But they were very much a maritime outlooking outlook nation. They had lots of um, seaborne trade going on, which is where the Dutch East Indies and other Dutch holdings came from in the first place, and that meant that they had a fairly large, experienced base of sailors and a need to defend them. Which then meant that when it came to, you know, going to war, it meant that they had this this pool of sailors to to draw on, and there was an understanding within the government as well that this was an important element of uh, national defence. And so when they went up against uh, the UK or England at the time, which of course was also a maritime outlook nation with a, a fairly large pool of reserve sailors, you got a very significant very difficult knockdown and drag out war for both sides whereas with the best will in the world the french and the spanish generally prioritized their army above and beyond everything else maritime trade and maritime security was a nice thing to have but at the end of the day the french would much rather go on a land campaign and try and take over half of europe than they would go off and and try and deal with stuff that's overseas and so having ending up playing second fiddle to the army it and with these other land-based strategic concerns, it meant that the French and Spanish navies, whilst they could have very good individual commanders and while they could have some very good ships and very good individual crews, as an entire entity, they never quite had that overall drive and experience level that the Royal Navy or the Dutch Navy could put out into the field. And that that's one of sort of the one of the biggest elements of you know man over machine because 
uh, especially at that period, the Dutch Navy did have some fairly significant technical limitations that the uh, French and Spanish navies, for example, didn't in that they had very shallow water ports. They had to therefore build relatively shallow draft ships, ships that had um, fewer guns and lighter guns than a lot of their opponents. The English had really big ships like the Sovereign of the Seas and, of course, the Royal Charles. And so on paper, the Royal Navy had an advantage in in ships and in theory if the crews were roughly equal that should give the Royal Navy um, the win but because the Dutch had were just as motivated just as skilled just as experienced and a lot of the time also remember because of where the Netherlands is relative to um, Great Britain they're also both fighting on approximately home turf they know these waters very well much better than a, a Spanish Admiral from Cadiz would ever know them and this is why you get these these huge engagements and why a lot of the time um the royal navy ends up losing to the dutch just a, just as often as they win and that shallow port issue you know, it's not an insignificant problem at the time because yeah they take the royal charles um and they've still got the stern <laughs> hanging up in the museum uh and i don't think they're going to give it back anytime soon but they kept the the ship around for a while, thinking, "Oh, this is one of these big English great ships. How can we uh, how can we use it? How can we put it into practice? Um, maybe make it our flagship." And they eventually came to the conclusion: we just do not have the port infrastructure. This thing has a deep draft. We we basically have to invest in a permanent dredging fleet just to be able to get it in and out. So they had a big party on it, then took it apart, grabbed the guns, sold the rest for, for reclaimed wood, and and kept the the shiny bit as a trophy. Which, I mean, yeah, good on them. It makes sense. Yeah. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Wolf Sweatpaws. Mm -hmm. uh, did the Dutch Navy bring any unique equipment or training to the battle areas in World War II? I mean, we already touched one unique equipment, the mm -hmm. Hasmir, uh, Hasmir mounts for the AA yep. guns, which I believe uh, the Royal Navy took a great liking to. Uh, but there was also the, we discussed it before the stream started, but I believe we did not actually mention it on the stream. While it's pretty important and uh, this time it helped mostly to the, it uh, was helped mostly to the Germans. But uh, since we are introducing submarines as well, the snorkel. So how, uh, like, uh, how come it uh, it came from the from the Dutch engineers in the first place, or when did it uh, when did the idea pop up? Because I mean, looking back at it, it seems so like clear and logical that it's weird that nobody thought about it before. But uh, like, I mean, all all important ideas like are like that, right? So, mm. so the the idea of a snorkel goes way back. The, the successes of the Dutch snorkel design is that it works reliably. Um, and But uh, you guys might, know, might be able to expound on that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Is If I remember right, the first instance of a, of a snorkel really getting off the ground is going to be like 1913 in Scotland. But, um, but I, that's as far as my memory goes. Yeah, the, the fundamental issue with... with uh... The reason why this thing is they're, they're trying to invent it is that submarines diesel electric submarines they have to be on the surface to recharge their batteries and to run their diesels which you know gives them the power to move and to do the recharging but that leaves them vulnerable you know they're not underwater they're not rigged for diving if someone catches them on the surface they're in trouble they might get away they might not submarines usually don't win surface battles so Someone came up with the, the great idea, well, you know, we've got the the air intake, because remember the um, diesel engines are burning oxygen, so they've got to have an air intake and an exhaust. So what if we had them on some kind of retractable pole, the same way that the periscopes are, are, are mounted, and that way we could have the submarine with either just the conning tower above the water or perhaps even just these two tubes above the water, and then the submarine could be running underwater, so it's much harder to spot, much harder to see. And if worse comes to worse, you can just switch the diesels off, engage whatever battery power you've got and dive. The problem, of course, is this would work in theory perfectly in a flat, calm pond. But 
the sea isn't flat and calm. There are waves, and if the waves come up and over, you know, best case scenario, they're going to swamp your engines by water come pouring down the pipe. Worst case scenario, they're also going to block the exhaust, at which point your submarine is rapidly filling with diesel fumes and also rapidly burning through its oxygen supply. The, neither of which are good things. So the idea of the snorkel to solve this is effectively a a, a floating ball stop. Um, you see this nowadays, it's fairly common in all sorts of plumbing, but the idea is that if a wave does come over, it will force these, these valves or stops down and it will shut off the uh, the route from the intake and exhaust to the outside world so you won't have water pouring down and then when the wave passes they can spring open again and life can continue the the problem and where you have to try and get this exactly right from an engineering perspective is that if you make the springs or whatever other um, form of mechanism you're using to keep these things open uh, and shut if you make them too strong then um they're not going to close when water comes over them but if you make them too weak then anything even a strong breeze might shut them or just standing water might shut them and then you choke to death or at least your engines die so you have to have them at this exact right spot where they will close and become watertight the minute any significant amount of water comes over them but they'll also open again the minute that water is gone and getting that balance right and getting it right not just in terms of the the, the spring tension but also in a system that will withstand the stresses and strains of the sea it's not going to corrode it's not going to lose tension over time it will re stay operational over weeks possibly months at sea that's actually a quite a technical engineering challenge for the time period and uh, as prince blip said you know people start working on this almost as soon as or even before submarines are actively used in sort of a full-on proper war but it takes a lot of time to refine it and of course the consequences of getting it wrong are quite disastrous so quite often people who who try to experiment don't actually live to report back to say what what went wrong they can only surmise um and navies the, obviously they get the a little bit the o21 escaped to mm. england and, and brought the system to england mm. but British didn't copy it. You know why they didn't trust it? Go on. Oh. oh. Is class I... going silent? Hello? 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 Yeah. Um, no, we don't know. Uh, well, I have. I remember one story, but I'm not sure if it's the right one. The reason the British said they didn't trust it was because. And this is the. the, the they were worried that the. Dutch had tested it for the North Sea, not the North Atlantic, and they were worried if it was also going to be too strong for the Mediterranean. They were worried it hadn't been tested in enough water, in enough water for the British submarines. But there again, the British did start trying to use it. It just took them far longer than the Germans before they started introducing it. It's, it's one of those things. The British... <sighs> uh, and this is going to sound terrible. At a certain point, the British decide our submarines are good enough. Any massive changes we introduce are going to cause a delay in submarine production. And we need to churn them out. And that's another thing people often forget about World War II. The British are churning out quite a lot of submarines. They're churning out quite a lot of anti-submarine warfare escorts. And they have air priority. Using them. Mm. Yeah. They also have air sub priority. The Germans didn't have, so they needed something. So their, uh, their submarines could go on the surface and they could fly the British flag and hopefully not get sunk. Although there were a few blue on blues which were interesting. Yeah, yeah I can yeah. imagine it might, uh, might have also been something like, uh, for example, the issues uh, everyone had with uh, foreign planes, especially uh, sometimes. Uh, uh, the British with the American planes or even Soviets with the American planes or uh, with the American tanks in that there often was some kind of like very nifty equipment like the stabilizer in tanks but uh, nobody really knew anything about it because it was a top secret and there wasn't time to get into it so uh, the crews just found it easier to just uh, switch off that uh, weird thing and uh, uh, don't be bothered by it so 
there might just not have been also enough time for experiments because the O21 was needed out there on the on the sea. Uh, and there's probably also a, a degree of just institutional fear of the idea in in, um, in general because um, even if if you go back and look at the K class submarines, um, some of their sinkings are somewhat snor like snorkel esque related, and that you have flooding going into the um, uh, into the 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 funnels and so you um and if any submariner was around then or even heard from crew member of these submarines they're probably a little averse to the idea of having any sort of floating opening um on uh, in in their submarines even if it's supposed to work i think the americans uh, copied it straight away after they captured uh a German U-boat in 1945. They were amazed by the system. Yeah, it, it's it's it it works, and this is the thing. It it's something that yeah we should have adopted. It would have probably saved a few ships, a few subs from being sunk. Um, but it yeah I I suppose I suppose that if you're going to adopt the snorkel or the Hazemai mount, if you're forced to adopt one or the other, not that. Not that we were, but I'd probably, given the British um, situation in the, in places like the Mediterranean with air, air attacks and everything, I'd probably want the Hazemai amount first. Yeah, yeah. That's true. True. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we are already reaching nine o'clock, uh, so mm. I, uh, I have a block of uh, questions that are relating to game that uh, we got from the... From the players, so I will just quickly go through them. Uh, but in the meantime, did you have already chance to try the Dutch cruisers in uh, in the game, and uh, how did you like them? I did. I, I mostly enjoyed, of course, the uh, the, the the German designed uh, cruisers because uh, <laughs> ah. they have the bigger guns. But uh, I just uh, Two days ago, I got the Celebes, and uh, it's a nice ship. It turns around quite nice, and it looks stunning. It's I, I, Java. I've been having quite a bit of fun um, with various t uh, tiers of Dutch cruisers. I'm, I personally actually am quite liking... I know some people are going to hate me for saying this, but I actually quite like the airstrike capability. Not because I'm particularly any good with it, not because I actually hit anything with it half the time, but because it seems to be very good at forcing people to not camp in islands. Um, if they're camping behind an island and nice and stationary, I'm like, oh, I might actually hit something with an airstrike. Then suddenly they see lots of uh, little parachutes coming down and they, they run away. Which is oh great! Now we're back into the action. We're actually playing. Uh, we're actually playing a warships game, not a I want to pretend to be an island with guns game. <laughs> you can use it quite successfully if you time that rightly with your own torpedoes, because they tend to take off forwards, and if you've got your torpedoes running through, they run into your torpedoes. Yeah, and uh, I gave the always good to course, be. Of course, I gave the the uh, had to give the the seven provincian. If I'm anywhere close to pronouncing that right, Both. Um, and I go because it, it just looks absolutely stunning. Um, the the firepower seems to like is not um, it's not a strong suit, but it has a lot of utility and um, can really kind of influence the battlefield in uh, more subtle ways than just simply destroying ships. So. Uh, for me, I have to say that I uh, I absolutely love the the Reuter. It's just a nice little tier four death machine. It's like mm -hmm. it has armor, it has uh, okay guns. It's it's just a fun little ship. Uh, and uh, Royal Express and a check attack uh, asked uh, generally. And I received the the Reuter from uh, Amazon Prime drops. Uh, what do I do do now? Uh, well, now you have it. Now you keep it until uh, the, and you keep it even after the branch comes into the public access, out of early access. Uh, you still, if you want to get through the uh, through the bundles uh, for the Dutch tokens, you still have to buy the uh, tier four bundle, and you will get uh, compensated because that's basically that's how the event is uh, is composed. So. Consider it a nice little uh, head start, but uh, unfortunately, it's not really skipping that uh, part. Uh, Zuchaj is, is 
Probably. Uh, is asking, uh, when will uh, Mich uh, Michel de Ruiter be added to the game, as in the captain? Uh, well, currently he is added to the game, but uh, we are using him uh, for uh, uh, engaging uh, new players and so on. But uh, we will be working on uh, ways how to bring him uh, to you as well. Uh, why is uh, the in-game port uh, of Rotterdam and not Den Helder? Uh, well, we know that uh, Den Helder is basically the uh, military port of uh, the Royal Netherlands Navy, but uh, we have chosen the Rotterdam basically for the visuals. It's uh, kind of the same why we have the London as a British port, for example, and not uh, Portsmouth or uh, Scapa Flow. Is Rotterdam is an iconic city and Den Helder sadly enough isn't uh yes uh i mean it's it's a nice little town the walk to the museum is pretty uh, comfortable but uh yeah there's there's just uh, more things to look at uh, uh, actually the same way uh, uh, for germany we have the uh, the hamburg and for uh, us uh, we have the new york uh, instead of for example norfolk so uh, I Rotterdam, uh, Rotterdam is actually the city for the Dutch Marine Corps. The oh. Marines are trained there, they have their barracks there, and uh, they are born there, actually, the Marines. Okay, didn't know that. That's uh, I, I thought that they were somewhere around the Den there as well. Okay. Uh, and uh, Unawen is asking, are the ships that uh, will be present uh, in game representative for the Dutch Navy? Well, I, I would say that uh, up to tier 4, they are representative of the Dutch Navy as uh, the Dutch Navy was uh, before and uh, early on uh, during the World War II. Uh, and after the Tier 4, it's uh, how the Dutch Navy could have been if uh, uh, someone didn't rudely start the World War a uh, few years earlier than even they wanted to. <laughs> so... Uh, because I mean, all the all the subsequent ships are based on real projects. Uh, some of them, uh, actually, several ships are based on the same class on the Desaven Provincian, which uh, underwent uh, a lot of renaming and a lot of redesigns from the more uh, conventional cruisers to the post World War II. Uh, modern anti-aircraft cruiser that will be the D7 Provincian. And obviously the top tiers are based on the design studies for the project of the super cruiser slash battle cruiser slash uh, name it however we want it, but uh, basically uh, lighter Scharnhorst. So yes, the, I, I would say that the branch is pretty representative of the uh, Dutch Navy and uh, potential Dutch Navy if the war didn't start. But we still have uh, actually a piece of the Scharnhorst in the Netherlands. Our National Military Museum uh, has in its uh, depot uh, the breach of one of the guns of the Scharnhorst. Uh, the Gneisnau, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. St. Claus, yeah. the Gneisnau. Mm -hmm. uh, those guns were taken off the, the Gneisnau, I think, in 1943. And uh, they were all dispersed along the Atlantic Wall. And one turret went to uh, to Rotterdam area to defend uh, Rotterdam against uh, a seaborne uh, attack. So uh, the breach we still have. And if we have an event uh, again, maybe uh, in the hell we can uh, arrange having the breach there. So you can actually see it. Mm. Does That's, the breach uh... block still work? <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to shoot at? <laughs> it's only the breach. Hmm. Well, to be fair, yeah. last time me and Drakenfell had guns in our hands, which were, you know, World War II era artillery pieces from the uh, Atlantic Wall, we were aiming at some historic vandalism, mm -hmm. or rather, I was because I was doing the aiming. Uh, it's, it's, the, the, the main reason I ask if the breach block still works is because it would actually give an opportunity, a very good opportunity to demonstrate the difference between the German um, sliding horizontal breach block which was pretty much unique to their capital ships by World War One, as compared to the interrupted screw breach block on a hinge, which literally everybody else used because it was a far more efficient design. Um, but for obvious reasons, there's not that many of the uh, the sliding breach block guns still around. Yeah. Well, we'll try to arrange it uh, being sent to the uh, Navy Museum if we have a, mm. 
a new amazing there. Yeah. And uh, where is the where is the military museum actually? It's the uh, it's in the Schusterberg. It's a really beautiful museum. Uh, um, considering the, the history of the Dutch Army, Navy and Air Force. It's really nice. Hmm. Okay. Well, I, I definitely plan to visit the uh, Netherlands uh, again. I have friends close to Amsterdam, so I'll try to uh, sneak in a visit there as well. Yeah, I, d I definitely want to go back. I really enjoyed my abbreviated day in Den Helder. Um, about the only thing I will say... The only negative thing I will say is I'm not flying back through Schiphol Airport again. Why not? Um, Heathrow is, in the UK, is known to be a pain to get out of. I can get out of Heathrow in 20 minutes if I don't have baggage to collect. Schiphol, I was stuck in that blasted place for an hour and a half. I swear it's designed as a first line of defense against people who try to invade the Netherlands by airliner. Uh, <laughs> this is why I keep telling you, travel the world by ferry. You're a yeah. naval historian, you right. go by sea. This is what we're supposed to do. <laughs> it's sea. I, I, I haven't been to the Netherlands to visit the museums or any sort of thing and i'd love to go there it's always been people always rave about it but i do recommend whenever you're traveling go by sea it's far more comfortable yes the ferry takes longer but you turn up you have your car you've had a nice meal you've had a you've got not got any you know travel sickness or anything because well you've been on a very large ship which has mostly been stable the whole way across and if you're very lucky you've gone the overnight route so you've slept the whole time Everyone in chat is telling me to go by to get out of Schiphol by train. Yes, I, I can tell you the same. I, is there a train from Schiphol to Den Helder? Yes. Uh, yeah, you I'm have to right, switch okay. in Amsterdam, I believe. But only an hour. Yeah. Okay. Well, in that case, I know what. I, if if I have to fly in next time, I know what I'm what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I have to say the train ride from Amsterdam to Den Helder was also very pleasing. Mm. The fields and uh, actually the, seeing the uh, canal system in action because you are crossing the increasing levels of the canals and uh, you mm. see how they work. It's it's really nice. It's... <laughs> the Eurostar now goes straight there as well. Does it? To Den Helder? Well, the Eurostar goes to Amst Amsterdam. I think you can get London to Amsterdam and then from there, Den Helder. I think. Well, I think memory. it goes between Amsterdam and Paris, but I'm not sure if it's going to London. Uh, it it does. It does. Okay. It does well. So, you know, that that's another way the of trying. avoid travel by train. Again, you can take more luggage. It's like the ferry, but you really can't, you can't take your car, but you can take more luggage. Mm, maybe. <laughs> I like planes. <laughs> planes yeah. go fast. Planes but, go zoom. Uh, but as I have a. a at least when I travel by aircraft, yes. I'm usually classified as self loading freight. So this might give me a slightly jaundiced view of air travel versus the rest of you. <laughs> but I, I still have a, a question. We, did, we didn't talk about carriers. Mm. And ah. the Dutch had a very nice. Carrier, a former British one, in 1948, uh, HMS Venerable, mm -hmm. uh, and we were planning to have three carriers at that time. We wanted to have a carrier for in the Dutch Indies, one for in the Dutch West Indies, and one in the North Sea. The Americans didn't like this at all. They just wanted our fleet to be focused on uh, anti-submarine and anti-mine uh, warfare, and that's it. But uh, we were really ambitious. And then in 1949, I think a, a new uh, budget proposal came, budget cuts, and uh, we decided only to have one carrier, which turned out uh, the, the Kyle Dorman. And it served until, I think, 1968 something. Because after we lost uh, Dutch New Guinea, it's, it's an uh, area near Indonesia in 1962, there was no reason to have a carrier anymore. But uh, there are some really 
great films made color footage on, on, on YouTube to find of this vessel. It's a great vessel and would love to see it as a premium carrier yeah. in the warships. Well, it and sounds it did uh... do a lot of there's a, there's a lot of stories about it doing exercises with the Royal Navy because as anti having the Dutch and various other powers having carriers as the US were because they wanted to focus on dealing with the Soviets. The Royal Navy in Britain was very pro other nations having carriers, mainly because they worked out that if the Americans were anti them, they tend to buy their equipment from the Brits. Uh, so what, we tended uh, to what, support them. Uh, what planes uh, did uh, Carl Dorman actually fly? Because I can't find anything much. Oh, let's see, I think. Fire, fairy Firefly. Oh. Walker Sea Fury. Hmm. And the Supermarine Sea Otter. Sea Otter? I, the Sea Otter, which was the uh, was the successor to the Walrus. Yeah. So it's a sort of flying boat. Oh, yeah. No, uh, no, that's, oh. That was and that was operated. Aircraft. And that was operated from the flight deck. Oh. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. Did not know about that actually. That was like, about the, the British, British, had, British used them as the well for that similar mission. And mm. it had the uh, Grumman uh, Avenger uh, dive bombers. Uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, I see that after after that uh, she was sold to Argentina and uh, became the uh, Viente Cinco de Mayo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was. Mm -hmm. uh, almost sunk by the British during uh, the Battle of the Falklands, which would have been a twist of history. To yep, be fair, is. we had oh, to be fair, we were using World War Two era torpedoes to sink their <laughs> World War Two era American cruiser, which the they Survivor renamed the Belgrano. So, you know, it would have been quite, you know, interesting for us to sink uh, one of our own produced ca aircraft carriers. Uh, you know, it, it, it would have been a form of recycling, I suppose, uh, you could <laughs> classify it as, as it's turning it into a reef. Crew might object to this unexpected recycling, but, you know, the Royal Navy are ever providers for the world's need, need of artificial reefs. <laughs> uh, not sure if uh, that area is, isn't too deep for the artificial reefs, but... Uh... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the Royal Navy uh... are world leaders in trying new methods of putting down artificial reefs, even in places where I... people might not think they feel should be viable. Actually, what, <laughs> what, while we're on the subject of, of sort of more modern stuff, you've also got to remember that um, one of the two De Seven Provencian class is still around. Yep. I think it's Peru, isn't it? Yep. It served mm. served out most of the latter part of the 20th century as Almirante Grau. Um, but they are going. They have ostensibly said that she's going to be preserved, um, albeit in Lima, which is uh, Peru's capital on the other side of the planet. But you know, if you if you want to see a real life <laughs> uh, Dutch cruiser, that's probably what, as and when they re, uh, reopen it as a museum ship. That's probably going to be definitely on my list of places to go and, and visit. And, uh, oh, and uh, uh, Almirante Grau was uh, her name in the Dutch service was. Surprise, surprise, the writer. Which I, of course. <laughs> and we have to say, um, this actually comes from the bilge pubs with the really new thing, the new Dutch and Belgian frigates. The Dutch, of course, are buying the sensible 16-cell option, which suggests they actually expect they might actually have to use their frigates in somewhere hot somewhere, or why well, hot as in some might be firing at them, whereas the, uh, the Belgians are buying it with only eight cells, which... I think the whole bilge pumps um, uh, description of was um, what happened to you, Belgium? You you just had to buy the design that the Dutch are building. You're saving money for no real reason. Because if you've got all the infrastructure in to support 16 cells anyway, and all the stuff, and you just then buy only 8 cells, you're not really saving that much money. Uh, you know, after observing the Czech army uh, procurement for uh, like uh, several uh, decades by now, it, it, this sort of thing doesn't surprise me. No, trust me. Bit it for, but not with. Ones. 
the Belgians doing the procurement now for mm -hmm. our new minesweepers, and we are going to do the procurement for our our new frigates, which the Belgians will also buy. We mm -hmm. have this uh, Admiral Benelux. It's an integrated mm -hmm. uh, navy staff. The Dutch and the Belgian navy staffs are integrated, and uh, they're based in in Den Helder. And the Belgians, they're doing all the, the, the training and the uh, maintenance of the, the minesweepers, and we do the M frigates. So it, it's and they are quite very nice. Good, they're good, very uh, nice looking uh, designs. Hmm. I, th I think at this uh, rate, one of these days, you're going to be driving through, and the, you'll see a sign that says, Welcome to Belgium, uh, a subsidiary of the Netherlands. <laughs> uh. We're just good friends. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah well, uh, that's a, that's of course what the MOD, uh, the Dutch MOD spokesman would say. That you know they're just good friends. <laughs> the border slowly yeah. starts expanding, and one night they, the Belgians will wake up and go, "Hang mm -hmm. on, Dutch have finally taken over." Mm -hmm. Well, I must say actually, good. what, what, what oh, probably on a, I guess we're probably come, coming close to wrapping up, but on a, a final note, I did. I did hugely enjoy my visit to the Den Helder Museum. The, the the staff there were very, very helpful. And um, unfortunately, I can't remember for the life of me his name off the top of my head, but there was a retired Dutch Dutch uh, Navy captain who showed me around. Um, and he was really, really nice and obviously knew his stuff because he, he'd been in charge of some of the, at least some of the bits of ship that were still there. Um, so I, I would strongly recommend if, people have an interest in naval history and they are able to travel to the Netherlands at this time obviously then um, do drop by the Den Helder Museum and give it a visit you know they've got multiple museum ships there for you to go and have a look inside um, they've got bits of other ships that were a bit too big to stick in the museum um, of the freeze logs mm. yes and yeah. uh, and of course we can't forget the the gigantic golf ball radar that was on one of the uh, the uh, older Dutch missile ships. The nickname of those ships were, uh, was uh, Kojak, you know the the bolt uh, <laughs> detect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I uh, recommend Den Helder. Yeah, I can recommend as well. Uh, apart from the very like interesting. Uh, uh, exhibits there's also a lot of interactive exhibits which are actually a lot of fun i suspect they are mostly done from trying to shoot them for example the <laughs> uh, japanese place in uh, java sea because uh, air control of the bow forces really wasn't as simple as that you really need at least two people to properly uh, coordinate and uh, the same with the uh, little mini game of, uh, of uh, sonar and identifying the sonar contacts and uh, stuff like that. So definitely visit it. The museum is huge. Uh, there, are, uh, there's the camouflaged minesweeper. There's a very, I would say, probably unique ship in the world, or one, one of the very few such ships in the world. The coastal defense monitor, the Scorpion. Uh, I mean, which, yeah. Yeah, which like it, it it's it's unique ship. It's uh, from when everyone was learning how to make these turret things work. So it's 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 really a unique place to visit, and uh, for anyone who lives in Europe, it should be fairly easily accessible, especially if you are somewhere in northern Germany, northern France, or in Britain. And if you are already there, go also visit the Maritime Museum in Amsterdam because that's also great in the uh, aiming not uh, at the uh, military uh, operations at sea, but rather on the, on the trade and uh, uh, yeah, mm. very, very enlightening there as well. Uh, and yes, uh, I think it's uh, time to slowly wrap up. So... Uh, we'll do the usual uh, ending statements and uh, uh, yeah, feel free to uh, plug uh, any uh, sites uh, or books that you want to recommend uh, uh, for our audience to actually find some more information about today's topic about the Dutch uh, Navy because, or even, uh, even websites because I think it's uh, area that is not 
as well known as it deserves to be because, well, as we found out today, the history of the Dutch Navy is really, really illustrious. Uh, so let's start uh, from Dr. Clark. Ooh. What can I say for the Dutch Navy? I would say, honestly, the illustrious history of the Dutch is look at who they are fighting. The Dutch never knowingly, A, take on someone small than them. They usually try and punch up. And B, they usually punch up hard and win as often as they lose. Yeah, and some quite often win more than they lose. In terms of good books... I'm trying to think. I know a few that are being written. And I would recommend to keep an eye out on the various Dutch history Twitter feeds. Because you can get some good naval history Twitter feeds on. I know some of them are being written again. I'm not going to try and pronounce the historians in questions names. Because I can't. Uh, but they are. I would also say that no one will be disappointed if they start looking up Dutch destroyers from World War II. If you want stories of daring do, you go to the Dutch destroyers. There is a reason the Dutch destroyers and the Polish destroyers feature so much in my forthcoming book, which I'm going to shamelessly plug, Tribal's Battles and Darings. It's coming out soon. Yes. Um, but no, uh, they are really, really interesting ships. They do so many random operations. And the Dutch get there. You find Dutch uh, uh, Dutch volunteers in various commando squadrons, which are theoretically British squadrons, but they have Dutch personnel in them as part of the commando units. And all sorts of things going around World War II. There are very few places you do not find the Dutch. And quite randomly, you often find the Dutch Navy. And that I can think of at least two Dutch naval lieutenants who ended up being acting as commandos in British units in various operations so they are interesting and go look them up you will find you will not be disappointed you'll also not be disappointed by playing them on world of warships although to be honest i think that one at least one of those ships was a little bit more unstable in real life which made it faster turning so i think <laughs> you slow down the pace of turning to make it look more, more look more stable for the gameplay in real life it was less stable than that but that meant it could turn really really quickly and that's another uh, one. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So, Drakenifel? Um, well, uh, in some ways similar to what Dr. Clark said, you know, um, let's face it, you know, the you, the Dutch managed to steal our flagship. You know, that they, they are <laughs> unique in this circumstance, and all credit to them, they, they pulled it off with great style and aplomb. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, uh, I, at some point, possibly end of this year, beginning of next year, I'll be starting a video series looking at the Anglo-Dutch Wars, um, which, uh, apart from anything, it's actually nice to have a, uh, it's nice to have an Age of Sail uh, campaign, which involves the Royal Navy, which actually is, well, today, we ain't going to win this one, <laughs> or the next one, or the one after that. But we do have Sovereign of the Seas, which is nice and shiny, so that kind of makes up for it. <laughs> he was very um, shiny. Yes. Uh, n never underestimate the Dutch Navy. Um, we've we've learned that to our cost um, over the years. And, you know, they, 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 along with a number of other free navies, kept fighting um, all the way through World War II. Um, I, ha I have a great affection for the Dutch Navy myself. And uh, long may it continue. Uh, thank you. And uh, last but not least, class, please, uh, your recommendations, your summary. Well, my summary or message would be that I think we have a great naval tradition and we have a great navy, but we also are a country that is always on the penny. You can see it in the start of the First World War, while we're desperately trying to buy dreadnoughts, which of course never came. You see it at the start of the Second World War, where we try to buy battle cruisers, but once again, we're too late with spending money. And you see it today. If you compare our fleet today, it's half the size of what it was in the 70s. But uh, for, uh, for safety and security, it's very important that we have a large navy to, because we are uh, a naval, uh, a maritime country. We need a, a big navy, so we need to... Uh, 
we need money for a good navy and i think at the moment uh, the netherlands is uh, once again underperforming uh but that's a bit of our history we have a great navy we have great people serving in the navy but we always lack funding to 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 have the ships we we need for that uh, maybe that's also for other uh, navies the problem but uh, it's something uh, we must uh, say uh, over and over again everywhere where we can uh, if you want to have security you need to have a good defense and you need to have a good navy uh, as for recommendations of books you see i i have really beautiful books on the the router for instance iconic ship but they're all in dutch so <laughs> i can't really recommend uh, an, an english book on on our navy you must follow me on twitter and mm. i will uh, tweet about our navy yes. that's that's uh, maybe a good point I yeah, think and that. that's uh, definitely well worth following. So I'm dropping the link uh, both in the Twitch chat and in the YouTube chat. Yeah, if you're interested on yes. seeing how, how the Dutch pulled off uh, building a, a navy with a shallow water ports in the Age of Sail, there is actually Dutch warships in the Age of Sail, um, 1600 to 1714, published by Seaforth. That's a pretty good reference book for the, for that period. That sounds uh, sounds very interesting. And since you uh, uh, mentioned the prepared series, I will eagerly await it because mm -hmm. I will expand <laughs> my horizon even more uh, than uh, uh, this stream, which uh, was uh, enlightening a lot. Uh, so, yeah, I would uh, like to thank uh, all of you for uh, stopping by and uh, uh, obviously uh, also... I uh, would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Uh, van der Pitt from the earlier part of the stream uh, for his contribution. This was a very interesting stream for on a topic that I didn't really know much about, so uh, I was trying to just absorb all the information uh, as much as possible. So, uh, thank you and hopefully see you around uh, next time. Uh, or uh, sometime in the future when we will be again uh, dealing, for example, with more Dutch ships, which may may uh, come. I believe there is a lot of blueprints out there. Uh, and uh, for the next uh, installment of Armchair Admirals, I think uh, we will again stick kind of sort of to uh, what will be appearing in the game and we will probably dive under the surface a bit. Uh, but uh, we will see. We shall uh, <laughs> specify uh, very soon. But as you might know, submarines are currently on public test and they will be coming to live server in a special mode soon. Uh, Mr. So, Prince Blip, closing statements. Um, so thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, I'm sorry I was I'm a little bit drowsy today. I had my second shot um, of the COVID vaccine <laughs> earlier. And so I'm... Just, <laughs> A little, little struggling to keep it together here, but we're, um, but um, thanks for coming. Uh, I know very little about the the, the Dutch cruisers, um, and especially from the the nineteenth or the twentieth century, um, and so it was very enlightening to learn more from um, Dr. Van der Peet as well as um, Klaus and Jacketenveld and Dr. Clark. So, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming yep. and thanks everyone who watched for uh, watching us. Uh, have a nice day and see you in some of the other streams or worst case in one month mm -hmm. in next installment of the Armchair Admirals. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.